Bliss. Hi everyone, Anthony Fantano here, internet's busiest friggin' music nerd. Not doing a review today, not doing a question, or a track review, anything like that. We're doing a list. A list that I compiled with somebody who's been hanging out with me on a regular basis for the past several months. His name is Chris. He's the Needle Drops intern. He's over there right now in the official TND uh, intern pen. I'm not an intern. This is my zone. Just share the space. Um, I'm going to list off three albums from this list, and Chris over there uh, is going to be reporting over there from the uh, from the intern pen because there's clearly not enough room over here. Um, this is a list of albums which, in my opinion and Chris's opinion, are way ahead of their time. Um, I want to start sure this Thanks, Cal. list no, no off problem. with... Do you like this band? Joy, I'm very happy. I know what you mean. I mean, the happy feelings. Is that a happy band? Not really. No, not actually. Why would they name themselves <laughs> Joy Division if they're not happy? Oh, Divide. Matt. <laughs> I get it. <laughs> okay, Chris. Chris, get over here. Over here. Over here. Don't don't talk to him. Nothing good can come of that. All right. We're going to start. I'm going to let Chris start with a, with a with a with an LP from from his list. Okay, Chris, Chris, take us off. Album that's ahead of its time, according to you. Go. go, go. Well, the first album that came to mind when I was thinking of this list topic was uh, the Modern Lovers' self-titled debut album, which came out in 1976. But it was actually recorded three years prior. Um, the album is really a collection of demos that were just recorded by the uh, the Massachusetts band, um, you know, in 1973, and then later were you know put together um, for inclusion on on an LP. But even for like 1973, these songs were like. Really punk sounding. They are. They're not, and, and not only punk sounding, but they actually have that kind of jangly indie rock style that many bands would later use in the 80s. Mm -hmm. Alright, so uh, you're starting off with that. I'm going to start off with uh, the first Violent Femmes LP. <laughs> Self-titled Violent Femmes album. I don't know if anybody's heard the entire LP, but I, I figure most people have heard Blister in <laughs> the Sun. That album was so ahead of its time that band didn't actually get popular until the 90s. That's right. I mean, the record is so 90s that it didn't get popular until the 90s when I believe they, they kind of came out with a compilation of kind of their best songs and Blister in the Sun just instantly became a radio hit. But the thing is, uh, and, and I remember growing up with that song and until I really researched the Violent Femmes, I, I always assumed they were just like a 90s band. Mm -hmm. you know. But then I totally freaked out when I heard that this album was recorded in 1983, you know, it's it's like this folk punk, post punk record, but also has these really whiny, angsty emotions that you really wouldn't hear in sort of like regular rotation in the indie scene until guys like Elliot Smith, Connor Oberst, and um, Simon Joyner, yeah, you know, or even like the Mountain Goats or something yeah. like that. Okay, what's what's the next record for you? Talking Heads' 1980 album, Remain in Light, is definitely another album that came to mind when I was thinking about this topic. That came out in 1980? Yeah. Oh, okay. I, I thought it was just maybe a few years later, too. No, it was 1980. Alright, so what, what puts that album ahead of its time for you? Well, it's interesting that you mentioned, you know, that you thought it came out later, because it actually... Um, that album has a lot of sort of new wave sounds that didn't really become popular until, you know, later in the 80s. But I think what's actually most sort of revolutionary about it is the, uh, the way that it was produced. From what I understand, from when I researched the LP before, I mean, he used a lot of looping on that LP? Yeah, that's right. Like, they just, like, took a lot of riffs and they just repeated them over and over and over again? That's exactly right. The band would go into the studio and record, you know, simple loops that like would just be... Yeah, exactly. Yeah. They would just be looped over and over again in the song. And when you think about how difficult it was to produce those... Uh, to, to implement those techniques at yeah. the time, I mean, it's really admirable. <laughs> they went on... You know, and David Byrne went on to do the same thing the next year with uh, My Life in the yeah, Bush, Bush of Ghosts. Ghosts. Yeah. All right, I'm going to move on to uh, to my next pick. Not really an album, kind of a collection of singles. Uh, it comes out from uh, two guys, two New York guys, uh, Double D and Steinsky, Lessons 1 through 3. These were like Girl Talk before there was even Girl Talk. They were making dance mashups of 
you know, of, of hip-hop songs at the time, of dance songs at the time, just pop music songs, radio pop at the time. Not only did this stuff, you know, kind of set a bar for albums that would come on later that also extremely, extremely uh, use sampling to, to get by, like, Beastie Boys' Paul's Boutique. Definitely uh, something ahead of its time in hip-hop. Well, my last pick was actually uh, one that took me kind of a while to think of. Um, it was a record that sort of struck me as odd when I first heard it, but never really gave it that much thought in terms of how, how it's influenced um, what came afterwards, or, you know, how ahead of its time it sounds. Um, Scott Walker of can, course do that, I, yeah. can do that to you. Yeah. Of course, I'm talking <laughs> about Scott Walker's uh, third album, uh, Scott Three. Uh, many people regard Scott Four as sort of the uh, the magnum opus of his, you know, more accessible early career period. But I actually think Scott Three has a more experimental edge. When listening to, um, you know, a group like Radiohead, you know, if you take an album like Kid A and hear those, those I remember hearing those strings on uh, How to Disappear Completely um, after listening to the Scott Walker record and thinking, wow, that really sounds exactly like you know, the string, some of the strings on that Scott Walker album. All right, here's my last pick for this uh, list, something that's ahead of its time. Gotta be the first uh, Mission of Burma EP, Signals, Calls, and Marches. Uh, these guys, if, uh, if I remember correctly, are a Boston, Massachusetts band. And uh, a lot of the sounds, a lot of the tempos, and the tapes and, and sonic experiments that were happening in the background of some of those tracks, just the, a lot of the abstract lyricism coming uh, especially from Roger Miller just reads to me as artists like Sonic Youth, you know, it's like uh, to, to think that the songs on this EP came out in 1981 yeah. is just really kind of difficult for me. This is just really out of place considering what year this stuff was coming together. Um, yeah, and those, those are our six, six releases of note that we thought were incredibly ahead of their time. Just gonna leave it at that. Anything else to, to say? Well, thanks to the uh, the guys on the forum who who ended up suggesting that uh, that topic. That was a uh, yeah, yeah, we that was a good one. I'm positive that there are more releases that are ahead of their time, <laughs> but you know maybe that's a list for some other time. Anthony Fantano, Chris. Chris.